Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where nostalgia isn't what it used to be. The 1980s were a fun time for some people, but for everyone else it was just another senseless decade of random death and destruction. Our series exploring the worst and mostly forgotten events of the decade continues. This time we focus on the terrible year of 1983. Bigamy, explosions, and nuclear accidents were just a few of the unpleasant events from this otherwise enjoyable time in human history. Let's begin with the story of a man who married over 100 women. The Marrying Thief Some people marry for love, but for Giovanni Vigliotto, marriage became his profession. We are not sure where he was born, when he was born, or if his name was really Giovanni. In 1949, he was at a flea market. He met a woman and proposed marriage to her right away. She accepted and they were soon married, but Giovanni wasn't interested in keeping his vows. Not long after becoming a married man, he ran away with all of his wife's belongings. Then he changed his identity. He then went to another flea market and sold the stolen goods. And while he was there, he proposed marriage to another woman. This was a pattern he repeated numerous times. When the woman accepted Giovanni's proposal, he would then marry her. He did this without divorcing his previous wife. Then at some point in the future, he would steal that wife's belongings and start the process over again. Between 1949 and 1981, he supposedly married about 105 different women. His life of bigamy was spread across 27 states and 14 countries. Giovanni's crime spree ended when his final victim, Sharon Clark, tracked him down. He was arrested for fraud and bigamy on December 28, 1981. At the time, he was 53 years old. His trial took place in Phoenix, Arizona in March 1983. After being found guilty, Giovanni was sentenced to 28 years for fraud and 6 for bigamy. He would never leave prison. In 1991, Giovanni passed away when a blood vessel in his brain burst. However, he would live on in the record books. He earned a spot in the Guinness Book of World Records for the world's most prolific bigamist. Benton Fireworks Disaster About two miles south of Benton, Tennessee, there used to be a place called Webb's Bait Farm. The business was established in 1978. It grew worms and crickets as well as other types of fish bait. Fishing gear was sold there too. Dan Lee Webb owned the bait farm, but producing fish bait wasn't enough for him. Until 1975, it was possible to purchase M80 and M100 fireworks in parts of the United States. Initially, they were created as explosive devices used during military training exercises, but as they became commercially available, injuries became quite common, so the federal government banned them. In December 1982, Dan began making his own versions of these powerful firecrackers in a barn. A friend who owned a fireworks store taught him how to do it and then connected him with suppliers. Dan was happy to embark on this new adventure because he needed money. Fishbait wasn't paying the bills. Over the next six months, Dan turned his barn into a factory. He hired friends and family and had them handle chemicals and assemble the explosives. The business was very productive and profitable. At least 1.5 million firecrackers were sold from the illegal operation. It earned $1.25 million worth about $3 million today. On the morning of May 27, 1983, 11 people were in the barn working. Several firecrackers and other chemicals suddenly caught on fire and then exploded. The barn was destroyed and the employees were killed instantly. Witnesses 20 miles away claimed that they heard the explosion. They could also see a mushroom cloud in the distance. Investigators never determined what caused the accident, mainly because there were many ways it could have happened. There were loose wires in the barn and various chemicals being mixed together. They even found a cigarette lighter on one of the tables. Dan Lee Webb received 10 years in prison for manslaughter and manufacturing explosives without a license. Over the next two years, at least 20 people around the country were charged with conspiracy for supplying the illegal operation. Nuclear Power Mishap the Embalse Nuclear Power Station was built in 1974 near Embalse, Argentina. The power plant is still in operation today. It uses uranium to produce power. Additionally, the facility also creates Cobalt-60, a radioactive isotope used for cancer treatments. It was also the location of a deadly accident. 
On September 23, 1983, an operator was working on one of the nuclear reactors. It was shut down and the operator changed the reactor's configuration using a crane. He was supposed to drain water out of the reactor before doing this, but this wasn't done for some reason. As a result, the reactor went critical. For a very brief instant, a nuclear explosion began. But thanks to safety features in the reactor, there was only a small explosion. The operator, however, was exposed to a massive dose of radiation. He died two days later. The United States provided many of the radioactive materials used by Argentina, but Argentina was not willing to allow independent inspectors into their nuclear facilities. Several legislators in the United States became angry after learning about the accident. They attempted to pass new laws restricting the export of nuclear materials. Despite these efforts, the United States continued distributing nuclear materials to countries worldwide. The Embalse nuclear power plant has experienced at least five other mishaps since 1983. The most recent problem was found in 2007 when a steam generator quit working. Mack Truck Killer Alcoholics spend a lot of time being angry at people, but they usually don't commit multiple murders over it. Douglas Crabb was born in Australia in 1946. At the age of 14, he began driving trucks. He continued moving goods for over 20 years. But as Douglas approached middle age, his temper became a serious problem. In February 1983, he was at a fuel station near Tennant Creek. There was a car full of teenagers harassing the store's employees. They provoked Douglas as well. He responded by leaping onto the hood of their car and jumping up and down on it repeatedly. Douglas was arrested for assault. Just a month later, on March 24th, he went to a gathering at Curtin Springs. During his evening there, he got in two separate fights with police officers. Douglas was thrown off the property and told not to return. For the next several months, it seemed that perhaps he could finally control his temper. But on August 18th, Douglas would demonstrate that he was still full of rage. Uluru is a popular tourist destination. On the eastern side of the rock, there used to be a motel with a bar. Douglas went there a little after midnight. He walked into the bar and began fighting with the staff. He was thrown out and told not to return. He walked to his Mack truck, then started driving toward the motel. He accelerated the truck and trailer it was carrying as much as he could. Then Douglas drove through the parking lot and straight into the wall of the bar. Douglas stepped out of his truck, smiled at one of the victims who wasn't dead, then took off running. Later that morning, police and aboriginal trackers started looking for him. They found Douglas and took him to jail. His act of revenge killed five people. In March 1984, he stood trial and was found guilty. He succeeded in getting that verdict overturned, but stood trial again in 1985. Douglas was sentenced to five life sentences. He's still in prison today. Byford Dolphin Drilling for oil is very dangerous, and some of those who work in this field have met incredibly gruesome ends. The Biford Dolphin was a semi-submersible drilling rig that was built in 1974. It was moved to various locations around the North Sea where it was used to drill for oil, and it didn't take long for the rig to start accumulating a body count. On March 1, 1976, a mistake caused the rig to run aground. The entire crew was evacuated, but six people fell out of the lifeboats and died. The Biford Dolphin was repaired and put back into service. It continued to operate for several more years before the next notable incident. On November 5, 1983, four divers were on deck in a diving chamber. These chambers are used to maintain very high air pressure for divers that work at extreme ocean depths. Around 4 a.m., a diving bell with two occupants was brought up from the ocean floor. It was connected to the diving chamber. After being retrieved, divers would typically leave the bell and enter the diving chamber. The chamber was pressurized to nine times the pressure normally experienced at sea level, but as one of the divers was going through the procedure to enter the diving chamber, a mistake was made. A clamp was released, which exposed the divers to one atmosphere of pressure. The result was explosive decompression. Five of the divers were killed instantly, and the one who survived was seriously injured. A medical investigation determined that the occupants of the diving chamber died within moments after their blood boiled. The other two were killed immediately when the explosive decompression shoved a door through their bodies. 
None of the deceased victims were entirely intact. The committee that was created to investigate the cause of the accident decided that one of the divers had made a fatal mistake. However, in 2008, families of the deceased divers acquired proof that the accident was caused by faulty equipment. Byford Dolphin continued to operate in the North Sea for several more years and wasn't retired until 2016, but it claimed one more life. On April 17, 2002, a Norwegian was struck on the head and killed while working on an oil rig. United States Senate Bombing United States foreign policy wasn't always popular in the 1980s. In October 1983, the U.S. military invaded the island of Grenada. Their mission was to replace the socialist leader, Maurice Bishop, who took power during a coup. In addition to invading Grenada, the U.S. military also participated in a peacekeeping action in Lebanon. This bothered the socialist leaders of a group called the Armed Resistance Unit. They decided that the best way to alter foreign policy was to detonate bombs. On November 7, 1983, the Senate adjourned a little after 7 p.m. A reception was then held near the Senate chamber. At 10.58 p.m., the senators and guests heard a loud explosion. Nobody was hurt since the Senate chamber was empty, but the bomb did a lot of damage. The door of Democratic leader Robert Byrd's office was blown off the hinges. A grandfather clock that had been in the Senate chamber since 1859 was destroyed, and several paintings were also damaged. After the explosion, the armed resistance unit called National Public Radio and took responsibility for the attack. They then sent the following statement. We purposely aimed our attack at the institutions of imperialist rule rather than at individual members of the ruling class and government. We did not choose to kill any of them this time, but their lives are not sacred. The group continued planning attacks for several more years. Federal agents finally arrested them on May 12, 1988. Six people were apprehended and after trial were given sentences ranging from 20 to 35 years. Two of the group's conspirators, Linda Evans and Susan Rosenberg, had their sentences commuted by President Bill Clinton on January 20, 2001. The 1980s didn't just provide a variety of entertainment options, it was also a buffet of death. What do you think about these terrible events from 1983? Did human arrogance and stupidity cause most of the suffering, or was it just bad luck? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Like this video if you enjoy this particular format, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss our weekly delivery of humanity's most troubling stories. And as always, thank you for watching Bad Things in History.